when you look at all these policies, um, what's interesting is that a lot of them, the whole point of the policies is to change product characteristics, so to guarantee not only that you know, people can purchase products, but also that the quality of the products is good. Uh, but then when you look at the standard adverse selection models that we have to think about this, they have a lot of trouble in explaining uh, what kinds of contract characteristics are traded. And so what I mean by this is that the two kind of workhorse models in the literature, one is the Akerlof model and then the generalization by Liron Enav, Amy Finkelstein, and Mark Cullen, uh, which this is kind of the workhorse model of most uh, applied papers in the literature. So Ben or John will present a paper today this kind of model later. And uh, you know, the typical assumption that you make is that there's only one kind of product that you can buy. So you know, either I buy insurance or I don't buy insurance. And the characteristics are exogenous, so there is, you can't really talk about you know, what, how equilibrium is going to change the characteristics. And the other kind of workhorse model is this Rothschild and Stiglitz model, where in principle, do endogenously determine what kinds of products get traded. You have to assume that people are ordered, that they only vary along some kind of one dimension. Uh, and then even if no, we do assume that people are heterogeneous along a single dimension, these kinds of models don't always have equilibrium. So you know, for a lot of pretty reasonable examples, what's a set of contracts going to look like, who's going to buy what, at what prices, and the model just kind of chokes, you know, just tells us, look, sorry, I don't have an equilibrium in this case. Um, so the goal of the overall agenda that this paper fits in is that we would like to understand the effects of different policies like this. Uh, and you know, we also would like to understand uh, what optimal policies look like. So you know, can we say you know, uh, you know, what the best possible policies are and how do they relate to these policies that people actually use? Uh, and so I'll kind of break up that problem into two. And today uh, this paper focuses on one half of this problem, on part of one half of this problem, which is that we want to develop a price taking model of adverse selection. So it's just a perfectly competitive model of how these markets work that's going to determine you know, which contracts kind of unravel and which contracts get traded uh, and at what prices and so on so that we do can understand the effects of those policies, for example. And in the end, I'll preview a little bit of uh, you know, another paper on um, some of the more normative things of you know, what are good policies and what does that have to do with what policies people actually do. Uh, and the basic idea, and I'll try to explain in two slides the whole talk, is that I'll use the same ideas as the price taking models of Akerlof and Anab Finkelstein and Cullen to both determine the prices of the contracts that get traded and determine which contracts get traded in equilibrium. So let me show you that in a picture. And if you're not familiar with this literature, try to explain how the Akerlof model works. So uh, this is the kind of picture that you, know, you probably see in Ben or John's later talk uh, from uh, this paper by Anab Finkelstein and Cullen. And so uh, the way this model works, that imagine there's only one type of, let's say, insurance contract. So either you buy insurance or you don't buy insurance. And what that means is that at any given price, I can draw a demand curve that tells me, at that price, what's a fraction of consumers who are going to purchase this one product. And I can also draw an average cost curve, which tells me, look, let's say that I set some price, and you know, I have the 10% people who have the highest willingness to pay for insurance purchasing this one product, then what's going to be the cost of the firms to cover them? And if there were no adverse selection and there's kind of constant return to scale, this average cost of covering people would just be some constant average cost. But if there's adverse selection, I drew this average cost curve as being downward sloping because it means that you know, the more people that buy, the people with the lowest willing to pay, they're actually cheaper to cover. So what, I, what I'm going to do is just that I'll, instead of just having one contract, I'll start with a potentially richer set of contracts, which you know, are the things that could maybe be being traded. And I want to use this kind of supply and demand model to determine what's the price of the contract that, that get traded. And a little bit more subtly, the Akerlof for Enab Finkelstein Culling model also determines whether the one product is traded at all. And so you know, this one example where in the equilibrium of the um, one contract model, you would have some trade. But here's an example where the average cost curve is always higher than the demand curve. And so that means that whatever price you set, the set of people who show up is going to be such that it's more expensive to cover them than the price. And so even if you could have some welfare enhancing transactions, no one's going to do any trades in equilibrium. So this is what Akerlof would call complete unraveling of the market. And so all that I'm going to do is that I'll start with a pretty rich set of possible contracts. 
And I'll use this model to determine the prices of the things that do get traded. And you know, a little bit more subtly, I'll use this kind of condition to determine what markets are going to unravel and which contracts are going to be traded. Um, and then uh, what I plan to you know, try to spend some time on is that you know, I'll try to get to a more applied example. So you know, going back to those questions in the beginning, so I'll consider an example where there's going to be a lot of different degrees of heterogeneity, and it's going to be a health insurance model. So consumers are going to be able to buy these policies, which are going to have, you know, it's, there's going to be a policy with 20% coverage, 40% coverage, 60% coverage, and so on. And then the red histogram that I drew here is going to be a histogram of in equilibrium, what's the quantity of each kind of policy being sold. And then the kind of policy experiment that I'm going to do is that I'll say, look, what if we impose a mandate so we force people to buy at least 60% coverage? And if we didn't have a supply side model, we would think that, okay, well, if I force people to buy 60% coverage, you'd have all these people who were buying less move to 60% coverage, and that's it. But then if you do have an equilibrium model, what's actually going to happen is that you know, as all these really cheap people move to 60% coverage, that really lowers the price of the 60% coverage and creates incentives for all the people who are higher up to try to buy less coverage to mix up with those people. And equilibrium is complicated, but you know, in the end you have this unintended consequence that you know, uh, actually uh, you already had some adverse selection the intensive margin, some inefficiency here, and you're going to have even, even more inefficiency because of this kind of effect. So uh, let me explain the model in this just one slide. Uh, so in this model there are some consumer types, theta and some set of all consumers capital theta. There's some distribution mu of consumer types, there's some set capital X of all the potential contracts X. Uh, Mr. Theta has some utility U of X P Theta if he purchases contract X at a price of P. Uh, and so the contract specifies everything about, let's say, an insurance policy except for the premium. So the premium is going to be this price P. Uh, and the cost for a firm to sell policy X to consumer Theta is C of X Theta. So let me just, I guess, go over this again. So, you know, so people, there's a lot of different people and they have some preferences for purchasing different kinds of products X uh, and you know, they care about the price P that they pay. And the cost, of course, oh by the way, if there is no adverse selection, then the cost function would only depend on the contract that you're buying and it would not depend on the kind of people that you're buying. So the reason why there's potentially adverse or advantageous selection is that costs do depend on the kind of person who buys these products. Okay, so let me just, um, explain how the literature fits as particular cases of this. So one particular case is the Akerlof model, and, or Anav, Finkelstein, and Cohen model that I explained in the previous slide. And so that's a case where the set of contracts is just zero one, so either you buy insurance or you don't buy insurance. And you know, you can have pre, a pretty rich set of types, but there's only kind of two contracts. Uh, and so the equilibrium is just given by supply and demand. We kind of understand this model pretty well. And this is the workhorse of the recent uh, applied literature. Uh, there's another example, which I, I would call like a toy example, which is the Rothschild and Stiglitz model. And so I'll explain this in more detail. But the way this model works is that the set of contracts is a little bit more interesting because people can have a loss that so they can buy from 0% to 100% coverage. Uh, but the set of types is much simpler. So the assumption is that there's only actually two types of people in the world. There's a low-risk guy and the high-risk guy, and they're exactly identical, but the high-risk guy is more likely to crash his car or whatever it is insurance for. And you know, in this model, you already have this equilibrium existence problem, so I'll actually use this to illustrate those problems. Uh, and then there's what I call an interesting example, which is that eventually, I'll just calibrate the demand side of an empirical model with several dimensions of heterogeneity, much richer types, and I'll try to see what happens in equilibrium. So that goes back to the mandate application. Okay, and in the talk, I'll just say that utility is quasi-linear. So people have, Mr. Taylor has some utility to pay, has some willingness to pay U for contract X, uh, and that these functions are kind of continuously differentiable and you know, things like that. Um, okay, so a price is uh, just, oops. Okay, so a price is a, a measurable function P uh, over the set of contracts X. So a price is a function that for every contract X tells you P of X, the price of contract X. Uh, an allocation is going to be saying who buys what. So it's going to be a measure over the set of types times the set of contracts. So intuitively you can think of alpha of theta and X as being how many theta types are purchasing contract X. Uh, 
Uh, and the, of course, you know, if you add up all the theta types, you have to add up how many there are, actually. And I'll say that a uh, price allocation pair is incentive compatible if almost all consumers are purchasing an optimal bundle. Uh, and by the way, I will use this notation all the time. So this is actually kind of important because we're going to really care about what's the expected cost of selling each contract. So given some allocation alpha, I'll write down E X of C for the expected cost of selling contract X. And you know, this is a condition expectation, so there's some technicalities. It is not exactly a function, but you know, that's not super important. Now, what I'm going to do now is that first I'll fail miserably at th trying to define a reasonable uh, equilibrium notion. And then after failing, I'll kind of you know, evolve that into a more workable notion. OK, so you could try to define an equilibrium, which I'm going to call weak equilibrium, by saying, look, let's find a price allocation pair that's incentive compatible. Everybody's maximizing. And prices equal the average cost of selling everything, which you know the second thing happens almost everywhere because of some technicality. So if I go on the Rothschild and Stiglitz model, let me just explain how this model works. Uh, what's going to happen is that in the x-axis I have all sorts of covers that could be sold from zero percent to one hundred percent. In the y-axis I have prices, and I just drew a curve P of x, which is going to be one weak equilibrium price. And there's two types of guys. There's the high risk guys and the low risk guys. In this particular e weak equilibrium, the high risk guys, I represented by this little dot, they're buying, um, sorry about that again, uh, they're purchasing uh, full insurance, and they're, the firms are breaking even. Uh, the low risk guys are purchasing less insurance than that, uh, and they're also paying uh, a fair price. Uh, and this is an indifference curve for the high types, and this is an indifference curve for the low types. So you can see that at those prices, nobody actually wants to go and buy anything else. So this is an equilibrium. It's a pretty reasonable equilibrium, and it would be the traditional equilibrium in the Rothschild and Stiglitz model when one exists. Now, I said that this is going to not be a very good equilibrium notion, and the reason why is that this is an equilibrium, but there's going to be a lot of other equilibria. Because that condition that price equals average cost, tells you what the price of things that are being sold should be, but doesn't tell you anything about price of things that are not sold. So for example, you know, if I change those, that price curve to this one, that's also an equilibrium. And this one's not so bad because the allocation's exactly the same, but I could you know, come up with another one where the price of every type of insurance is really high, nobody buys anything, and you know, uh, that's an equilibrium because price equals average cost. So the problem with this is that you get way too many equilibrium. So what we're going to do is that we're going to find some refinement that picks a subset of this equilibrium. Uh, and the idea of the refinements, I'm not going to explain uh, you know, exactly the math definitions, but the idea of the refinements is that um, we'll just say that instead of having every possible contract between 0% and 100%, let's say that you only have like 100 contracts. And for every contract, at a tiny bit of crazy guys, or some behavioral types who always purchase that contract and have a cost of zero. So what that does is that now, at least the cost of everything is well-defined in one of those perturbations. A perturbation is going to be picking the set of 100 contracts and the small measure of the behavioral guys. And you can't really have prices are way too high because if none of the stereotypes buy a contract, then prices just become way too low. And the real definition of an equilibrium is that it's going to be uh, the limit of this kind of perturbation. So let me just show you that in a picture instead of math. Uh, so you know, this would be a perturbation. So instead of have, having every possible contract, I'll pick out this finite subset. And uh, there's going to be a little bit of behavioral guys. This is an equilibrium of a perturbation. And all the equilibria can have to look like that. Because for example, if the price of this contract were really high, like in that gray line previously, then none of the regular types are buying that contract. But then that would start driving the price of the contract down. But once the price gets driven down below this line, the standard types would move from the thing that they were buying before to buying this. And if they're breaking even here, the only reason why they would do that is if the firms are losing money. So the market kind of unravels because you know, if, you were to low, if you lower the price and nothing happens, nothing happens, but if no one's buying anything. But if you lower it enough, then you have this inflow of these really high cost guys. Uh, so I'm not going to do this in math, but then the definition of an equilibrium is just going to be something that's the limit of the equilibrium of these perturbations. So you know, take one that has you know like 20 contracts and you know 1% of these crazy guys, 
and then take one that has 100 contracts and you know, 1,000th of a percent of these crazy guys, and so on. And if you keep going, you're going to end up with the only equilibrium being that uh, original Rothschild and Stiglitz equilibrium. Uh, so that's the equilibrium notion. And um, I'll kind of, and uh, an equilibrium always exists in this model. And I'll save a discussion of whether this makes sense for, I guess, uh, after Matt's comments. Uh, and instead, what I want to do, and I think there's a lot of good questions that you might want to ask, but what I want to do is that I'll just kind of switch gears and talk about what this looks like in a more realistic model. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is that uh, I'll look at uh, equilibrium in a model where, so I'll take actually uh, a, a, a demand model that's from an empirical paper by Liron and some co-authors uh, that uh, it's a health insurance model. And so uh, they got, they all kind of calibrate their main findings, which are based on kind of the choices of the, employee, of the employees of a large US company choosing insurance. Uh, and I don't want to go into the parametric details of the model, but let me just explain what the heterogeneity that people have in this model is. So, so in this kind of model, people have a health shock and they decide how much to spend, but people are also heterogeneous in some moral hazard parameter. So some people, if you cover 50% of their expenses, they're going to spend more on health insurance. And in the talk, I'll just do, uh, you know, in the paper, I also do a nonlinear model, but you know, in the talk, I'll just do a model where the contracts are linear. So they just cover, let's say, 20% of your losses or something like that. And so just so you have an idea of order of magnitude, so M is 4,000, about 4,000. So that means that, you know, on this calibration, uh, people on average have a loss of $4,000. The standard deviation of losses is much higher. Uh, and, you know, there's some other parameters. And uh, I'll assume that the types are kind of log normally distributed uh, and just calibrate them as well as they can to uh, what their findings are and do a lot of robustness analysis and vary par parameters and try to understand how things change when parameters vary. But I'll not go into that so much. Okay. So if I take that really complicated demand model with these four dimensions of heterogeneity and I calculate what an equilibrium is, then it looks like this. So the contracts are these linear contracts, so they go from 0% coverage to 100% coverage. The black line are prices. The fact that they're convex kind of suggests that there's adverse selection going on. But to see that better, I think it's nice to look at these balls. And so the height of the balls is proportional to the average expected health shock of people who are purchasing those contracts. And the size of the balls is like a histogram. It says how many people are purchasing each contract. So the fact that the balls are going up tells you that uh, people, are per people, there's adverse selection on average. So you know, people who buy the better contracts, on average, they have higher losses. Uh, the fact that the balls are zero here and here uh, means that no one's buying those contracts. Uh, and so you know, just like to clarify what's going on, is that uh, behind that, you know, I just like, I'm just trying to draw the demand profile. So if I did a scatter plot where the x-axis is the average loss of each consumer, and the y-axis is the risk aversion of each consumer, uh, and you know, so each consumer can draw them as a little dot here and color this by the kind of insurance they're purchasing. So you can see that you know, on average, the people who are more risk averse or the people who have a higher expected loss are going to purchase more insurance. Uh, of course, you also see some red dots here because you know, there's only two dimensions of heterogeneity that I drew in this picture, but maybe this guy here, he had low average loss and risk conversion, but maybe he had really high moral hazard parameter or something like that. And so now I'm going to try to use this model to understand the equilibrium effects of a mandate, for example. Uh, so you know, this is what happens if I do not, if, if we just let the market run. Now if I force everyone to purchase at least 60%, we get back to that picture in the beginning that all these really cheap people move to purchase exactly 60%. Uh, but then what happens is that the people who are purchasing more insurance decide to reduce how much they're purchasing because they want to mix with the 60% people. In equilibrium, it turns out that the prices, which are this blue line here, are going to be continuous. They're always lower than the original prices because you had all this influx of really cheap guys buying those policies. Uh, but you know, a lot of people who are purchasing more insurance, you can see the size of this ball is smaller because a lot of people who are purchasing more, they're already purchasing inefficiently too little insurance, and then they moved to uh, purchase 60% to mix with these other guys. Um, okay. Now, the other thing I guess that you can see, and I'll try to use my last five minutes on this, uh, and hopefully have some bonus time, is that when you look at this picture, this doesn't look super optimal uh, in that, you know, 
Uh, I guess it depends on what you know, welfare notion you're going to use and so on. But there's just like this kind of weird lump in the beginning of the distribution. And so I want to talk about, uh, and this is uh, mo from another paper, and I'll actually be kind of informal in my discussion. Uh, I want to talk about, OK, well, what if I can choose the prices optimally uh, so that I can use subsidies or you know, forbid people from purchasing some contracts and so on? Then what would the optimum look like? Uh, so to talk about that uh, and to talk about you know, these kinds of inefficiencies, uh, what are, so by the way, by efficiency, so I'll use a very particular notion. So I'll just add up uh, willingness to pay of everyone who's purchased in every contract and subtract the costs. So I'll use you know, what would be Calder-Hicks efficiency, even though in this case, you, know, you, you probably wouldn't have lump sum taxation. But you know, I'll use something like just maximizing total surplus. Uh, so not talk about the kind of Pareto efficiency. Uh, and so just to think about that, uh, the things that you want to define are marginal costs. So the marginal cost of Mr. Tater purchasing contract X is how the derivative of, of cost with respect to X. How much does it cost to give him a little bit, of, a little bit more coverage? The marginal utility is how much Mr. Tater is willing to pay for a little bit more coverage, the derivative of utility with respect to X. And then I'll define this number that's going to be important which is the intensive margin selection coefficient, which is that I'll take the derivative of the cost in an allocation of everyone who's purchasing contracts that are a little bit bigger, and I'll subtract from that the average marginal cost of those guys. So it, what SI means is that as I move to higher and higher contracts, I am both in increasing costs because the contracts are better, but I'm also increasing costs because the set of people who purchase those contracts is potentially more expensive. So SI is how much of the cost increase is due to selection as opposed to being due to the contracts being better. Uh, so just to do the standard micro of this, uh, in equilibrium, in equi take some, fix some consumer data. In equilibrium, he's going to look at all possible contracts. He's going to look at his marginal utility. He's going to look at P prime, the incremental price of purchasing a little bit more coverage. And he's about going to buy the contracts where those two are the same. That's not what I want to do for the maximizing surplus because then you would actually want to look at where marginal utility is the same as marginal cost. So there's actually going to be two kinds of inefficiencies. So first, uh, because the consumers are heterogeneous in several dimensions, they can have several different kinds of marginal costs, and marginal cost doesn't have to be equal to P prime. Uh, second, even on average, if I look at all the consumers buying some contract, their marginal cost doesn't have to be equal to uh, P prime because P prime is going up also because of the selection effect. So if I, to, you know, if I draw in bold the average marginal cost of everyone who's buying, let's say, this contract, and if I, or, yeah, and if I you know, draw you know, in like in the thin lines the marginal cost of each person buying those contracts, there's two sorts of inefficiencies. So first, any given person, there's no reason for their marginal cost to be the same as P prime. And second, even on average, the marginal costs are different than P prime, and the difference is going to be this intensive margin selection coefficient uh, S I. Um, so you know, so that's why you know you're going to get a lot of uh, at least in the surplus sense inefficiency, uh, and you know it makes sense why these policymakers always want to nudge with these kinds of markets. Uh, and then another question that you could ask is, okay, now let's say that you could choose some so give firms some subsidies T of X for each contract, and you know potential or let's say that you can make firms charge whatever price schedule I want and just give them a subsidy T of X so that they break even, then what's the optimal subsidy? So uh, there's actually a, a good way to calculate that. So actually uh, use a methodology that uh, was used recently by Emmanuel Saez. Actually, Avnash has some nice work using this kind of method of just saying that you start some allocation and you just slightly perturb that allocation and see how people respond. And you can find some uh, necessary conditions for being in an optimal uh, under some assumptions. And then in this case, the formula for optimal regulation actually tells you that the subsidy, the marginal subsidy that you want to give, should be equal to SI, this intensive margin selection coefficient, uh, minus this covariance term that's a little bit more complicated. And so the intuition for this is simple, that what the SI term is, is doing is that it's kind of leaning against this adverse selection that, you know, if there's adverse selection, even on average, the expected cost of people buying some contracts are going to be higher than P, pri P prime is going to be higher than the expected cost. 
and the difference is going to be this SI term, the intensive margin selection coefficients. Now, moreover, if, if I condition on all everyone who's buying X, and I calculate the covariance between the elasticity and marginal cost, if that's positive, that means that the people who are more responsive, and this is like an intensive marginal elasticity that, yeah, you can look at uh, the paper and uh, for definition, but you know, so the people who, if the people who are very responsive to prices have higher marginal costs, you actually don't want to give such large subsidies because you want to nudge those people to buy less insurance. So that's what the second term says. And then, you know, numerically, uh, just, you know, trying to think about those policies from the beginning of the talk, uh, if I look at, you know, the mandate, uh, you know, the mandate had this big unintended consequence and it looked like this. And if I look at the optimal regulation, it's actually pretty different from the mandate because not only you want to get people to be in the market, but I also want to give this large subsidies in the intensive margin. You can see how this curve is much flatter than you know, this curve uh, because you also want to address uh, adverse selection in the intensive margin. Uh, and so you know, in our baseline calibration, this varies a lot and you know, there's a lot of uh, different counterfactuals that we went over. Uh, so you know, in this calibration, the mandate raises welfare by like $150 and the optimum regulation raises it by an extra $150 so you get you know, just as big of a gain from trying to influence this in extensive margin as from trying to, in the intensive margin, do good regulations that nudge people to address this uh, adverse selection in the intensive margin. So uh, I'll just conclude and I'll actually discuss some questions that you might have in Matt's discussion. So you know, I guess the basic idea from this paper is to apply supp the supply and demand approach from this one contract models to more general cases and this gives us a simple model to explain contract characteristics and kind of make sense of, you know, um, policies can be helpful for increasing surplus, but you also want to look at regulation and the incentive margin and that look at product quality, which typical people in this really would think it's very important. Uh, and, uh, you know, I want to thank everyone. And, you know, I guess just in the spirit of this conference, I just put three pictures here, one from the two type Rothschild and Stiglitz model, one from the numerical example with much richer heterogeneity, but it still was kind of parametric, and one from this non-parametric kind of sufficient statistics formula. Uh, and you know, I think looking at this paper, you know, and like kind of like a glance description of price theory, uh, you know, I think it uses a lot of you know the complete model kind of approach and a little bit of the price theory approach. And so I guess it's kind of a you know a good illustration, at least in our case. It was helpful not to say, you know, like Avinash was saying before, you don't want to have a decide between having either a hammer or a screwdriver, you know, maybe you want to use both. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward for Matt's comments. All right. Thanks so much. So I'm really happy to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed reading it. I think it's, it's a really rich, potentially important paper. There's a lot of stuff in it that Eduardo didn't have time to talk about here. Um, and so I think, I think kind of broadly, I want to focus my comments on just trying to sharpen a little the sense of what is the contribution of this paper going forward. So a, a really high level, even higher than where Eduardo started motivation for this paper, is there's a lot of economics has developed in settings where we take as fixed the set of products that firms are offering and focus on price as kind of the key variable that firms are choosing. In reality, in many settings, the choice of which products to offer is, is as important, more important. That's certainly what the you know, managers of firms spend a lot of their time thinking about. And, and that matters because what products get offered is both a potential instrument of policy, like mandates or regulations on what things can be covered, and also something, if we think about counterfactuals, changing policies, changes in the mix of products that get offered can be one of the most important effects of that. So you can think about that in kind of outside of insurance in traditional markets, say in the market for cars, we regulate all kinds of characteristics of those cars. That's a big part of regulation of those markets. And also when we uh, change policy, the, cha the mix of those product changes. So Tom Ullman has this nice paper showing the auto bailout, understanding the effects of the auto bailout really requires understanding how the set of products change endogenously. Here we're going to focus on insurance uh, where we have both of these things again. So the, we're regulating characteristics and how characteristics change endogenously, which plans get offered, which contracts get offered is going to be a big impact of policy. Um, so where are we sort of 
in, in our ability to ask and answer those kinds of questions, um, you know, a lot of people have been working on that. And there's a lot of work in I.O. trying to think about models where uh, the set of products that get offered is endogenous. Those models tend to be hard. They're hard because, you know, these tend to be imperfect competition models where firms are making explicit choices about which products to introduce or not introduce. There's been a lot of progress, but I think those are still limited to pretty simple settings um, and where the set of possible goods are restricted. Once we start thinking about insurance, we layer on a bunch of theoretical problems where we have equilibrium notions that don't guarantee existence. You have selection as an additional force, and things, things are even harder than they are if, if we're talking about cars. Um, so it's been, it's been very hard in this literature basically to make any progress on cases where the set of uh, products is endogenous. And the frontier you know, for kind of cut, cutting edge empirical work remains cases where, where, where we take some very small set of contracts as given exogenously. So this paper, I think, does two things, both of which are potentially pretty important. First, introduces a new definition of competitive equilibrium in these markets and shows a bunch of powerful things about that. It guarantees existence in a broad class of settings, which is not true of many of the other notions gets rid of these pathological equilibria, like we all think the contracts are all going to be priced at infinity, so nobody buys anything. Um, they show in the paper that those have other properties. They're robust. There's a really nice thing that's left in the appendix showing that there's a kind of, you can think of this as a limit of a more micro-founded kind of uh, competitive process in each of these markets. And then there's this very nice application that Eduardo spent a fair bit of time on, which I think on its own is kind of a s significant contribution. Um, okay, so let me give you just a kind of overall sense of how I see the contribution of this paper and then talk about some more specific comments. Um, so a couple of questions I'm sort of not qualified to answer, but I think that uh, theorists could fairly ask about this paper. So first, you know, this, I guess I, like, maybe an important thing to say overall is um, these guys are not the first to ask, can we take this price-taking uh, price perfect competition assumption and apply it to think about not only the equilibrium in a given market, but uh, which sorts of things are going to get produced. There's a, there's a large literature trying to think about how might you extend the logic of the price-taking assumption to generate an equilibrium con concept which is more robust. So uh, lots of people have been doing that. This is a particular way of doing that using this refinement of adding behavioral types uh, to these markets and thinking about this limit. Is that a good refinement or a bad refinement? That's a kind of aesthetic question. You know, who are these behavioral types? What are they doing? I, um, from my perspective, all that matters is does it work and give us good predictions or not? So I don't really, but I, I think other people might you could fairly ask about that. The other is just how large is the marginal contribution? Um, conceptually, theoretically, their notion is quite close to, for example, the notion in this uh, Dubé and Giancopolis paper, they're doing something different. Um, so again, I, 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 think, I think to me the question is, that paper has not led to a huge amount of valuable empirical work trying to understand these markets in practice. So the question is, is this paper going to do that? To what extent does it allow us, practically speaking, pragmatically, to make progress in answering questions that we couldn't answer before? Um, what is the answer? I think, so if you read the introduction to this paper, Eduardo is a pretty understated guy, so like this doesn't come up so much in the talk. But if you read the introduction, it sounds like it's, it's, it's amazing progress. Because state before this paper, we could say nothing about endogenous product characteristics. Now we can do it, and we can do it in this incredibly general model. We can have arbitrarily rich products. We can have arbitrarily rich heterogeneity. Consumers could be behavioral. They could be rational. You kind of almost anything you want. Um, so we sort of solve the problem. My assessment is, I think, similar, but with maybe one rather than three exclamation points. I think it does allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. But as, 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 as is often the case, writing down a model which is very general is different from being able to generate insight and actually do something useful across all of those specific dimensions. And so in that sense, I think, um, uh, I don't think the problem is solved, you know, all, all of the problem. And I think there's some, some, maybe some ways in which the paper they could sharpen a little bit, telling us exactly what it does and doesn't do. Um, 
OK, so just like a quick high level view of, from my perspective, what is the, if, if we think this is a paper which provides an answer to the question which products are endogenously going to be produced in a market where you had some large space of potential products. How is this paper, this concept, answering that question? Um, and I guess the way I would think about that is it's, it's an empirical fact that in any market we look at, the set of products that are actually sold is a very small subset of the set of products that could be sold. The set of potential cars that could have been made is much, much bigger than the set of cars. And the set of health insurance contracts that could have been offered is much, much larger than the set that actually are. Broadly speaking, I think, I think the, the, the main way that in I.O., in trade, and lots of other fields, we've thought about why that's the case is because there are fixed costs associated with introducing individual products. So if I want to design a new health insurance contract, there are fixed costs on the firm side to set those products up. And there are also, in a sense, fixed costs on the consumer side, where if I show you a menu of 1,000 cars, that requires investment for you to sort out that isn't required if I only show you a menu of three. So I think that's sort of been the, the, the overwhelming general response to why is it that we see only a small subset. The other force that we know is operating in, in selection markets is unraveling. So another reason we might not have a market is because adverse selection is severe and, and the market unravels. And I think basically the approach of this paper is to say, let's think about a model where we don't have the first thing, we just have the second thing. And unraveling is going to be the force that determines which, get, which products get offered and which don't. And then the, the very elegant general theory here kind of boils down to two basic predictions that it makes about the equilibrium. Any contract which is actually traded must satisfy price equals average cost. And, and that's, I mean, this, this predict, this is shared with many other notions, any, all of the notions of competitive equilibrium in these markets make that prediction. What's kind of the, the, the <clears throat> new meat of this is to say, well, it gives us an answer to what's not going to be produced. It has to satisfy the condition that if something's not being produced in the set of consumers who value it the most, that is, if I lower the price from a high level, the first consumers who are, good, who are going to buy it must include some consumers whose, whose cost would be greater than their price. So lowering the price from a high level and going just below that sort of choke point is going to not be profitable. Right? So Eduardo showed these pictures. That's what happens in a mar market where things are traded. This is what could happen in a, in, a, in a product that's not sold. And what I said is essentially that the equilibrium condition is going to be on what happens right here. That the average cost, roughly speaking, it's that the average cost curve needs to cross the y-axis above the demand curve. Um, so I think one just kind of clarifying comment that's helpful for understanding that notion and how it relates to some others is this is a, it's an equilibrium concept that just thinks about local deviations. So for example, I could, I could have a market that looks like this, where their condition is satisfied, and it could be an equilibrium under their notion for this contract not to be traded. But there's another, there's another price because marginal costs are falling quickly, there's another price. If I lower the price far enough, I'm going to pull in low cost types into the market. And so it would be a profitable deviation for a firm to come into this market and offer a price down here. Um, and, and a single firm could do that and could make a lot of money. That deviation is not considered in the equilibrium concept. So we're going to get, it's, it's really, it's, something is going to be in equilibrium if it satisfies a local condition. And so more generally, you could have, you can have sort of standard Akerlof markets with you know, a bunch of different places where price equals marginal costs. Under Nash equilibria or many of the other notions, only one of those is going to get picked out as an equilibrium. And here, all of them would be equilibrium. So that's not good or bad. That's just um, to kind of understand what's going on in that notion. OK, so, so a few kind of thoughts and questions uh, in terms of evaluating the paper. So I'm, I'm going to think of this as basically three sorts of things practically that this model could help us do better. One is pen and paper analytical theory. Another is numerical theory. And another is empirical work uh, in these kinds of markets. So first, um, you know, is, is, so it's, it's been a feature of this literature that because of these existence problems, 
even writing down simple analytical models where we can ask questions about things like what happens if we introduce a mandate and there are a bunch of different contracts or what happens if there's multidimensional heterogeneity has been hard. Um, this paper doesn't really give us any, it shows that it, you can replicate the predictions in the canonical uh, sort of classic models where we have lots of other concepts that can do that. There are no other analytical results in this paper. I think something that, the, that this paper doesn't do is say, if I write down a, a model, how might I find their equilibrium? And that's sort of important because directly testing this equilibrium, directly checking their equilibrium contact, concept is kind of impossible. It relies on, I have to set up these uh, limits as the share of these behavioral types gets small. And I think direct checking of it is, is very hard. They give some necessary conditions for their equilibrium, like I just showed you, but those are not sufficient conditions. You can get lucky, and if, the if, if you can show that only one price vector satisfies those necessary conditions because you know an equilibrium exists, then you've found an equilibrium. But I think, I think it would be helpful, and my sense is maybe they actually could go further in giving us either overall or in some special cases sufficient conditions so that we, we sort of have a recipe for, as a pen and paper tool, can we use this to, to answer questions we couldn't before? Okay, so that's one thing. Second, is this helping us do better numerical theory? That is, simulating more complicated markets, looking at experiments, looking at counterfactuals. I think here, the, the, the paper makes a pretty convincing case that it does, and that's part of what I really like about this paper, is it doesn't just give us the theory, but it spends a lot of time and effort on developing a real rich application. Um, that, that, that delivers some new insights. Practical issues, if I think about using this model more generally, one is that there, that there are multiple equilibria in this model in general, and there may be a lot of equilibria for the reasons that we were talking about. So that's always makes this more challenging. Um, the other is just, they don't say anything in the paper about the properties of, the computational properties of this equilibrium. That is, is there an algorithm which I can follow? If I write down a model and I want to think about contracts where there's guaranteed coverage and there, there are various set of characteristics and I have certain heterogeneity in mind, is there an algorithm that's guaranteed to find an equilibrium? They do it for their case, but I think, I think they could, it would be nice to know more about is, is, is there a formal result on that? Is there some guidance on how to do that, when is it going to work well, when is it not. I actually think, again, probably they, they, they could show us that result and it would really help. And, and I sort of have this suspicion that in this horse race of all these different equilibrium notions, actually probably the most useful thing about this one, even more so than the existence issue, may be that it's actually very amenable to, to computation, the way it works. So, so these other equilibrium notions are things like, well, if, if if one firm deviates, would there then be another firm that could deviate later on who has some particular, and that would have certain characteristics. And computationally, checking that stuff is really hard. You can't really, like the Riley equilibrium and Ben and Mike and Egal's paper, that's very hard computationally. Okay, so last comments. Um, what about for empirical work? The difference between the kind of numerical theory exercise and actually doing empirical work is in empirical work, we actually need to fit the data. And I, here I'm a little bit skeptical that if we take the approach of define a really rich contract space and then let this model tell us which products are going to be produced, I think the odds that we have anything that lines up with the real data in most contexts are very slim. And you can see that in their application, actually. In their application, it says all contracts will be produced. This is a market where actually, you know, two or three or something contracts are actually offered. So, I suspect the reality is in most empirical applications, this is still going to be very useful, but we're still going to have to start with three products or five products or some small space that we've kind of defined exogenously. So I think there's some suggestions of ways that they could help us see, you know, are there markets where they actually think that this is going to be a good tool for answering the question about product selection? If so, what are they? I don't know. Um, how robust, are there places where actually you can vary X and it's not going to matter too much? My sense is it'll probably matter a lot in many cases. Um, there's a bigger question in the background, which is like this perfect competition notion is really powerful and really useful in these markets. 
the existence of fixed costs as a key driver of what gets produced is in tension with that because fixed cost tends to push against perfect competition. How do we reconcile those? Is, a wor is there a world where there are fixed costs determining what gets produced but conditional at being produced? Perfect competition is a good approximation. I think maybe yes, but that's, that's a good thing to think about. Final thought is just, at least the way I think about this paper, as, as I've said from the beginning here, the main novelty of this paper is about a theory of product selection. And the paper in the application, they basically show us nothing about product selection. The application, there is nothing about product selection. In the, in the equilibrium, all products get offered. The mandate counterfactual is just changing x exogenously, but still everything gets produced. Um, the social planner problem that he talked about at the end is super interesting. What is the optimum? But for that, you don't need this theory at all. It doesn't rely on this theory at all. So I want to see more about actually what this theory was designed to do, which is give us a theory of what gets produced. Can you show us what are some predictions for that? How does that play out? OK, thanks. Is really all that you're imposing is that the price function and the average cost function are continuous at a quantity of 0? I mean, in some sense, that's really the essence of what's going on here. If you want to think about it just from a price theoretic perspective, without bringing in any of these sort of like types or whatever. And when you think about it from that perspective, I think it also immediately lends an answer to Matt's question about computation, which is, you know, we have a bunch of general equilibrium computation things. There's all this work by Smale on Newton's method from the 70s, and Ken Judd has built on that. And there's some really cool stuff recently from computer scientists. And, you know, you can, I think you can more or less blindly apply that stuff. And that's sort of what's nice because we can just bring in all the tools from general equilibrium theory and that just like lets us go to work on this stuff. But. Well, so this, yeah, so this is a great commentary. I guess I'll try to go around. Ed's prob Ed is probably the boss. Okay. I'll try to go around more, but you know, just like to Matt's point, that Matt actually was like right on the money that um, I've been working a lot with kind of like analytical paper and pen models um, using this. And then, you know, if you actually want to, you know, find a tractable way to do comparative statics and so on, you know, you, you guys are exactly right that, you know, what you use that is that you use those properties. And then, you know, basically with that, you can like do theory pretty tractably. Um, and so, yeah, those properties are kind of just pretty yeah, But then there, yeah, there's some, you know, technical cases, I guess, where those properties are actually going to do something crazy, but, you know, uh, so that's why the definition is, I guess, a little bit different from how you operationally do most of the grant. But so, yeah, and any other? Yeah, so I'm going to build on, on, on Matt's comments. I, I also agree. I think this is a paper that uh, I guess I first read almost a year ago, and I've enjoyed sort of thinking about honestly over the past year because it raises a lot of really interesting and important issues in an old literature, and it's a really fun thing to see. The thing that I guess I've been thinking a lot about as it relates to this conference, sort of on the, the tools of price theory, say, relative to, to gains, one of the things that sort of comes out of the old literature on this is that the assumption that price is average cost is actually no longer always reasonable. And I've given yeah. you this comment, so I apologize for giving it to you again. But, you know, in, a, in just the, the kind of standard Ross Child stigma setup, um, you could start off with just a uh, say one one type and you just have sort of a price equals average cost. We all agree that you just have you know, perfect competition would do it. But one of the funny things that comes in, if you introduce sort of a very, just one guy that's got a infinite, uh, got a probability of one of experiencing the event, uh, so that would be very, very costly. Then the, the rest of the people in the market would be like, okay, that's great. This guy just walked into the market. I'll pay a little bit more for insurance. Fine, I'll cover it. But what happens in an unrestricted contract space, as of what Ross Child and Stiglitz note, is that then now there's an incentive for another firm to come in and screen those guys apart. And how you allow that to happen you, 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 is really the essence of whether or not A, you allow for an equilibrium, and B, whether or not that equilibrium is efficient. Because the, in your model and in the Riley model, you would actually destroy the entirety of the market because you have to have price equal average cost conditional on the set of people that purchase it. So that one person that walked in just prevented all the N minus one people from getting any insurance whatsoever. Now, the efficient equilibrium would allow everybody to pool on that, on that contract, and we might think that the pooling equilibrium would be A, what we would see in practice, and B, what uh, 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 would be closer to, to an efficient type of, uh, type of an outcome. Uh, 
And so it's very nice that you get around the, this is exactly what drives the existence problem because then in the Rothschild Singlet setup, you get these cycles where you split them apart and you want to pull them back together. You split them apart and you want to pull them back together. Um, and so you can get around that by, by sort of fixing the contract between P equals average cost and then you introduce the nice game to get around that, that kind of a structure, but it introduces these kinds of, it still makes me a little bit, uh, as you know, uncertain. So, so I mean, so just because we've talked about this a lot, actually, you know, before I move, on, move around the floor, I would just kind of uh, explain Nathan's question to, you know, people who've gone, you know, didn't do papers on adverse selection and so on, like we did, and you know, we've talked a lot about this. So Nathan's question, Nathan actually asked a really great question, which is, look, in this Rothschild and Stiglitz model with only two types, if you only had the low risk types, then it's efficient, all the low risk types buy full insurance. But then you add, you know, like one, you know, high risk type, a very small fraction, and all of a sudden you get this really inefficient equilibrium. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, I think it's one thing that we talked a lot about. And so one thing that was really interesting, and, you know, actually, it was actually thanks to, I guess, talking to you about this, that, you know, eventually we kind of figured this out, was that, yes, so this is true in the Rothschild and Stiglitz example, but then eventually we managed to kind of prove that generically, if you look at kind of a richer model, you know, that's like almost never true. So, you know, these kinds of properties that, you know, you can slightly change, you know, the support of stuff. And then, you know, the old equilibrium disappears and a new equilibrium appears that's like stable and the only one. And yeah, so like that kind of like doesn't happen. So for example, uh, when I went on that numerical model that, you know, I showed in my talk, one thing that I have done is that I have done exactly this. I've added a couple of guys who really like insurance and who, you know, who have an even higher cost. So, and then what happens is that, you know, you go to MATLAB, and as much as you try, MATLAB ends up very close to the original equilibrium. So the original equilibrium actually doesn't disappear. And there's a new one, but it's kind of unstable, and so, like, you no know, MATLAB can't, you know, can't ever find it. So that's kind of, you know, an interesting. And I think this is, like, a more general point, which is that I think what was interesting about working out this project is that you know, there's like 30 years of debate of when you have two types, what's the most reasonable thing that can happen. And I guess you know, the way that I've been thinking about it lately is that when you look at that and you get some crazy results, you don't know if you got a crazy result because you assume that, look, there's only two types of people in life and they're clones of each other, except some of them are you know, worse drivers. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I'm not saying that this is like the only equilibrium concept, and I think it's interesting to look at other equilibrium concepts where, for example, price is an equal average cost all the time and so on. But, you know, and I'm actually trying to come up with things like that that work more generally. But, you know, I've, what I've found that really helped me to think about it is, you know, just like go to more realistic settings and then ask, look, you know, what are the properties of this as opposed to being like in this world of clones, you know, what, what kinds of properties you get. So I guess what I would say to that yeah. is that in a world where you have simple unobserved kind of heterogeneity, it's mm -hmm. nice to know that your whatever solution concept you have has reasonable properties in a setting where you understand the type space, yeah. as opposed to where you just blast it with noise. Yeah. And I think that the concern, say, in adding the high-risk guys, is not this goes back to Matt's point about what is the set of X's that you're allowing to be traded. Yeah. And Rothschild and Stiglitz set up, like, there's this, this, when you introduce that one bad-risk guy, there is a contract you can sell which sort of is naturally tailored to that guy, which is, you know, I just give you a really high co-insurance rate. Yeah. <laughs> or, sorry, a really low co-insurance rate for that one guy. Yeah. And so the question is, what is the analogy in your setting and that where you're considering these various co-insurance rates, I can introduce a high mean-risk guy, well, maybe there was another contract that is interesting. And since you're after the question of what are the set of contracts that will be traded, I think it's a question that sort of naturally comes in that you, that you have to address. And then I think, you know, to, uh, toning down the kind of unobserved heterogeneity, making sure the model is applying reasonable uh, uh, refinements to that structure, I think is important before understanding how well it works in a richer structure where you're blasting. Well, real life has a lot of heterogeneity that we don't understand, but no, I, I, I people do stuff I think, for all know, sorts of reasons. Theoretical, but, yeah. who, are, who is the type? Like, you know, what's your type? Rate? And if I wanted to like tailor a contract to you, imagine I knew everything about you. I mean, it, it, it's like almost an impossible computational problem to even figure out. Given all of your biology, I could read that's your whole right, genetic that's why code. I would I mean, that would not, you know, that would, that would apply in a world where I model your type as something more that is not as restricted. Before I take it to that world, I want to know that whatever equilibrium notion I'm applying solves some. I can understand what it's doing to actually construct a prediction, and whether or not I think there's cross subsidization across people. I think this makes a lot of sense, and it's interesting to think about you know, the spirit of the conference, you know, like in glance classification yeah. of price theory. You're taking kind of like the, you know, what is it, what is it called again? Reductionist. Yeah. yeah. One of those two approaches. 
And it's, you know, I think it's a good approach to take too. I think it's kind of like the, the best analogs that I've thought about kind of like, you know, this are one is kind of like in finance, you know, like if you want to test that, you know, the efficient market hypothesis, you're not just testing the efficient market hypothesis. You're doing a joint test of the efficient market hypothesis and some asset pricing model. So, you know, if you get something, if you forget that markets are not efficient, it's because the asset pricing models are bad, which, you know, in this case, it's, you know, Maybe it's not true that there's only two types of people and you know, most people are good drivers. And then, you know, the other thing is an analogy that Glenn had, which is that like, you know, in physics, it turns out that, you know, if you take a star and you crumple it into a basketball, you get some pretty wacky results. But then, you know, so is relatively wrong or, you know, is it, you know, just that that's a weird situation. <laughs> so <laughs> is it that solution concept or is it just that, like, you know, it's not true that it's like a bunch of clones and some of the drivers and you know, whatever. So yeah, but, but I'm really interested in other solution concepts that's that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a policy set up where the, um, the applicants are pre-screened. You, you, you just talk about high risk, low risk, and they self-screen without the insurance company doing any screening, which would really cause adverse selection if someone said they were low risk when in fact they had pre-existing conditions which would make them high risk. No, that's a, that's a great point. So it's like once you start looking at applications, most adverse selection actually exists because of community risking regulation, community, community rating regulations, which is basically in a lot of different insurance markets, you know, the government comes in and says, look, you know, you can only price discriminate on age or something like that. And then, you know, guess what? There's going to be a lot of, you know, should you even call that adverse selection? Because, uh, yeah, but that's interesting, you know. And so in this other paper that we've been developing, you know, like this uh, optimal policy formulas, then, you know, we're really interested in saying, look, let's say there's like a bunch of groups that have different observable characteristics, then, you know, how do you want to set different prices for them? Uh, yeah, that's super relevant. And that's like the source in real life of most of the so just to like to echo, echo Eduardo in thanking Matt for the comments, um, the exercise that he put on the slides were for so we had rich demand side, but you had a simplified supply side. So you assumed linear contracts. In the paper, we do a lot more realistic uh, contracts with copays and deductibles, and in that case, most contracts are not traded. There's a bunch of contracts that are not traded. Yeah, one thing that's fascinating numerically that I don't understand yet is that sometimes you, if you go on MATLAB. And you put contracts that have you know different copays and different you know uh, deductibles and so on. So you have this you know pretty high dimensional contract space. Sometimes some of the dimensions get squished out and you get kind of like a line of contracts. So when I understand why that happens, I'll you know explain. Yeah, I, that's similar to Matt's question. Yeah, I mean, there are two ways to get one is yes, like that, that non-linear contract thing says this model can make interesting predictions about small sets of contracts. I want you to show us that. And, yeah. and, and also, I think, I also took that as, as, on a more cautionary side, an example that the predictions of this model are very sensitive to how you define X. Yeah. And so you define it one way, you get the full set of contracts, you make it a little richer, and suddenly now we only get a very small space of contracts. That robustness seems important. But do you actually get welfare results out of that? Or do people like, get, get very different utilities? I mean, it seems like you could you know, getting the full set of contracts versus not is in some sense not really the welfare relevant outcome. It's like you might get only a line of contracts, but they all might be very similar to the full set of contracts that you get in the other case. And it seems like that's in some sense the relevant question to ask. But. I see. So you're saying maybe like the positively it's very different, but you know, normatively it's just yeah. Be like something. Yeah, I mean, I've been on this yet, so. Neil, did you have a last question? It was, I mean, it, it was related to this, I guess. You know, in practice, I think people who do empirical work look for settings mm -hmm. where, for institutional reasons, there's really just one main dimension mm -hmm. on which there's sort of all the action, because those are areas where then you really need one instrument, which is already you know, hard work. And two, it's then we can sort of solve the models because uh, you know, we have sort of more uh, tractable theory. And so I guess you know, when we start to think about all these different dimensions, um, I mean, one, one question is sort of what is my x going to be? Yeah. And, and I guess it, you know, you sort Your of told me that when you go to MATLAB, like maybe there's only some types of contracts that appear, but I'm, 
I'm sort of worried that if I think about a policy which opens up a set of contracts, that you're going to get all these things. And in the real world, we don't think we're going to see all those things. And so how do we, how do we place structure on contract space? I think is a good question. So I think that, yeah, so actually, that's a really interesting question. And then this is actually something that I thought about a lot because, you know, I've been reading a lot of, you know, like the applied work that you've been doing and a lot of other people are doing you know, where kind of like from the application, you kind of have a good sense of what the potential contracts are. So you know, an interesting example is kind of like uh, Maria Polyakova's job market paper that's, you know, about this supplementary drug insurance in the US. And that's a really interesting market because the, the government forces everyone to offer the default contract, but it's a very bad contract because you get a lot of coverage, then no coverage, then a lot of coverage. It just doesn't make sense from an economic perspective. And the firms, in principle, were allowed to try to offer other contracts. But all the firms that tried, you know, ended up attracting this really bad type. So that's, you know, the kind of, you know, particular setting where you kind of know, you know, like what it's a reasonable counterfactual to look at. And, you know, endogenously, there is this kind of unraveling happening. Um, but then actually, so another, you know, point related to your question is that one thing that I understand a lot better after working on this paper is just kind of like how these different strands of the empirical literature kind of fit together. And so I'm just going to try to explain this to you know, non-experts uh, in the area. So for example, Ben has this nice paper in the Econometrica with Egal Handel and Mike Winston that they use a competitive model. So it's like very similar to what we're doing. It's like we're doing a particular case of, what they're doing is a particular case of you know, this kind of model. Uh, but then there's other kinds of IO papers. So for example, Amanda Stark from Wharton has a nice paper in the Rand Journal that she does a more you know, run-of-the-mill IO model that there's differentiated products. Sure, consumers have this heterogeneous cost, but you know, firms set a price and there's this Nash prices competition. And you know, there's a, Liron has a very good student in the market this year. Uh, Pierre Tebaldi has a similar model. It's just a very common way to think about it. So one of the things that, have, that you know, didn't, Matt mentioned this briefly. So one of the results in this paper is that we worked out a model that's similar to Amanda's, you know, like an IO differentiated products model. And that in equilibrium, you know, something happens in that model, but as you increase the number of firms and you have a particular rationing rule, and you know, the firms have a small efficient scale and so on, you end up converging to the competitive model. Uh, so one thing that was interesting in like, you know, working out this paper is that I think now I understand a lot better how, you know, stuff like what Amanda Stark's doing, this like, you know, very typical IO models, and this competitive models, like you know what Ben is working on, they're actually you know like very you know part of like you know the same kind of family <coughs> model. Because if you take a Ben's model and you know, it takes some limit, you end up in you know the kind of stuff that Ben's doing. Um, so um, yeah, I guess one interesting thing was you know just like understanding a lot better uh, you know how these different models are related. And you know, on one hand, when you look at the competitive stuff. You're not really, you know, making all those conduct assumptions and so on. But then, you know, on the other hand, in all, you know, a lot of these markets you do have, there's like you know, evidence by Mark Duggan and Limor Daphne of, you know, all this market power in your paper. Uh, so, you know, I guess it depends on, you know, what kind of market you're looking at. Um, all right. So, uh, as we go to lunch, I want to actually leave it, leave it on a slightly lighter note. And I promised these guys I would tell a story before we went to, to lunch. So, um, uh, but it is related to this work. So, so one of the important points of policy implications, of course, was this notion of unintended consequences, the mandates. And you know, one way to see that in the context of their structure is this correlation, say, between the elasticity and the marginal cost that you have to know in order to create the optimal subsidy, right? So I mean, that's a parameter that, that's, that has to be known. So um, when you think about unintended consequences, it, that, by definition, means that the government lacks some information ex ante that they have ex post. Because you know ex post, you got it wrong, but ex ante, you know, you didn't know that, or you would have built it in. That's that's generally what that means. Um, so I want to uh, give you an example of of one that actually happened in my life in government um, that illustrates this, and it'll bring us back to Becker and Friedman. So you'll see where I'm going with this. So when uh, once upon a time, back probably 2007, um, 
I had a, a graduate student, a very good graduate student, just got his PhD at Stanford, and he came. He wanted to come to the Council of Economic Advisors. Said, I, "Okay, you can be my you can be my RA, at the Council of Economic Advisors." Just got out of school, just got his PhD. Smart guy, and I so I gave him. He and the vice president and I actually had a little disagreement about whether we should fill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I don't know if you were there, Dennis, at the time, but it was how much oil we should add. You know, should we add more more oil? Should we buy it now? And the question was, you know. Why do we need to store oil? Why can't we just store dollars and go out and buy it on the spot market if we need it? You know, and you know, unless we, there's a blockade, you know, and if we've got a blockade, we've got bigger problems than you know storing oil. Um, so, so I, I tasked Ben with uh, figuring out is there a rationale for doing this. So Ben's a very clever guy, so he writes down a model and he comes back a few days later and he says, well, you know, here, here's the model, you know, suppose the government has better information on this and then you got this and this and this and then he said, you know, so then there's this, this logic why you'd actually want to have oil as opposed to dollars for this thing. And I said, so I said, Ben, I said, who's the government? He said, well, you know, you know, government, you have many agencies that you know, have the information and stuff. And I said, I said, Ben, you're the government. <laughs> and I said, and if you get my attention, then you and I are the government. <laughs> Do you really think that we have better information than ExxonMobil about this industry? And, you know, so when you think about this and you realize that the government, I mean, it's kind of scary. I am, the, I was the government in, in this situation. We're the guys making the decisions. And I think the, the reason I mention this is that if you sort of think about unintended consequences, and bringing in the government and thinking about what you're doing, it kind of brings us back to, to Gary and Milton's view, which is that unintended consequences are the rule rather than the exception, and it's because the guys in the government don't have information that's anywhere near as good as the people out in the field doing it. So I thought I'd leave it on that lighter note and uh, I would enjoy have lunch. Thing, Eddie. I'm sorry. I, I think the, the more price theory answer is they're likely not unintended. You want to go back to think about whose incentives there are to have those policies in the first place. Yeah. And they like to claim they were unintended, but I mean, it gets back to the prep. You know. That's more a Stigler view, actually. Yeah, I think, but I think that is it. Well, but no, just more generally. I see yeah. something happen, I see this equilibrium, and I say it's in a, whose interest is it in? Yeah. Why do we get, why does this exist? Yeah. I, I just think that's the question you always got to ask. Absolutely. You know, that's the, that's why equilibrium is almost more important than anything else. Why? Why, who, why are we getting that? Why, why does this happen? I don't know, that's just my thought. Well, you know, and, and actually, there was an evolution, if you sort of think back to the early Chicago view and the later Chicago view, there was an evolution because at one time, guys like George Stigler, Dennis, you probably you know, remember this in the early days here, you know, was all about busting up monopolies, and, and then he kind of decided, well, maybe that's not such a good idea because their incentives for the guys busting these things up that may be on the other side of those transactions. And There's a lot uh, of good things you could do, but if I gave you the power, why would you do those? Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Anyway. Same question. All right, good. Well, well, let's go to lunch. Uh, we've got a full hour, uh, so we don't resume until 1.15, and uh, 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 look forward to seeing you then.